Jacket spends most of his time in Hotline Miami being sent to murder violent gangsters by strange messages left on his phone. But interspersed between this mayhem, Jacket visits his friend Beard whose disposition greatly contrasts with the Russian gangsters. Beard shows a genuine care for Jacket, implying a deep friendship between the two. And indeed, the two have been friends for years, stretching back to their time spent together in the Russo-American War. While the friendly demeanor of Beard is always welcomed by Jacket, there seems to be something strange going on with his friend. Why does Jacket see him working at so many places? Does he really have this many jobs? And why does he act different depending on where he's working? The answers to these questions actually reveal a story of tragic denial. Let's trace this friendship back to its roots, see how it's evolved over the years, and figure out the story of our friendly neighborhood Beard. The first time we see Beard is way back in 1985. He was enlisted in the military during this time and fought in the Russo-American War, specifically in the Hawaiian conflict. He was a member of an elite special forces unit named the Ghost Wolves, which included a few other soldiers, Barnes, Daniels, and ever silent, Jacket. In March of 1985, the group is lounging at a local bar when Beard says he's going to head back to camp. Barnes and Daniels decide to stay behind while Jacket decides to leave with Beard. When the two exit the bar, a war correspondent stops them and asks them if they can pose for a picture. The two agree, and Beard asks if he could get a copy if he gives a reporter his address. But the reporter tells him that won't be necessary since they have a Polaroid camera. The two move into the sun and Beard puts his arm around Jacket who puts up a peace sign while the cameraman takes the picture. He hands Beard his copy and the duo hop in the back of the truck to head back to camp. That night, the Ghost Wolf's commander, a man known only as the Colonel, sends them on a mission to raid a Soviet camp. They easily ambush the Soviets and take several soldiers prisoner. Inside the Russian commander's bunker, they find intel that will be helpful for the war. After dealing with their prisoners, they return to camp. Six months go by, and America and Russia are still mired in their war. The months of fighting have the Ghost Wolves contemplating their life after the war, while Jacket sunbathes nearby. Barnes says he'd like to open a bar, which Daniels replies to with a snide remark. When Barnes asks what Daniels is going to do after the war, he reminds Barnes that he was a teacher, and that's what he intends to go back to when the war is over. Barnes then asks Beard, who says he'd like to do anything that doesn't involve killing people. He imagines working in a convenience store, sitting there relaxing with a little TV close by. Daniel says it seems like he has everything figured out, but Beard says he tries not to think about it too much, since things never turn out the way you expect them to. He then says he's going to check on the Colonel since they've been waiting a while for their mission. He finds the Colonel alone in his hut, and when he enters, the Colonel announces that he's up for a promotion. However, he doesn't seem that excited about it lamenting the fact that America will likely lose this war. He then tells Beard the Ghost Wolves are likely going on their last mission, which he says is a real piece of shit. They are tasked with charging an entire enemy camp with only four soldiers. It seems unlikely they'll succeed, but since the Ghost Wolves are an elite unit, they manage to kill all the Russian soldiers and take over the camp. Afterwards, they meet with the leader of D Company, which has been trying for weeks to take over the camp with no avail mentioning they've had some heavy casualties. He tells the Ghost Wolves to set up camp and get some rest, saying his company will join them after he rounds up his men. After setting up camp, the Wolves want to celebrate completing their last mission. Barnes wants to check around to see if the Russians left any alcohol around, and Beard says he wouldn't mind a drink either. However, Daniels warns it'll be a while before the Colonel and D Company arrive, so they should probably settle on water for now and save the celebration until after the others arrive. Barnes says they don't need D Company since they took the entire place by themselves, but Beard agrees with Daniels, saying there's always safety in numbers. He decides to go lie down and asks to be woken up when the Colonel arrives. However, when the Colonel does arrive, he has some bad news. Even though they've completed their last mission, there's been a change in plans. There's a heavily guarded Russian power plant nearby, and the Wolves have been tasked with capturing it. It's a suicide mission. The night before their last mission, the wolves are gathered in their bunker, reflecting on their supposed last assignment. Barnes is upset and thinks their superiors are trying to find a way to get them killed, and, uncharacteristically, Daniels agrees with him. Barnes wonders why they're being sent in with no support, 
and Beard mentions the place is likely too risky for a whole platoon, saying the ghost wolves are more expendable. There's suddenly a crash of lightning, and the colonel walks in from the rain wearing the face of a panther. He raises his arms and says this is his true face. He continues on, saying that they are all animals and have no minds of their own. They're just brainless puppets being ordered to kill, never asking why, because deep down, the violence and destruction they're tasked with carrying out, they love it. Hesitantly, Beard asks the colonel if he's okay. The panther face slides off, and the blood-soaked colonel explains that he's had a little too much to drink. He says he's going to head off to bed, and Beard says that's a good idea. After leaving, Barnes wonders aloud what kind of things the colonel's been drinking. The next morning, tension fills the air as the ghost wolves prepare for their suicide mission. The colonel meets with Beard and gloomily gives him his last briefing, then proudly says it's been damn good commanding these soldiers. Beard picks up his weapon and heads off into the jungle. Barnes loses a grate, granting Beard access to the power plant, and he sets out to complete the impossible. Incredibly, not only does Beard fight his way through the power plant and make it to the general's office alive, he finds Barnes, Daniels, and Jacket have also made it. Even with all the odds stacked against them, they've come out alive. Inside the nearby office, the Soviet general has killed all the engineers, and when he sees the ghost wolves, he kills himself. However, he put the power plant in meltdown before doing so, and a siren starts blaring. Jacket and Barnes rush to a nearby elevator, which suddenly blows up, destroying half of Barnes and throwing Jacket against the wall. Daniels rushes to Barnes, who is still alive, while Beard rushes to Jacket. He picks up his friend and rushes into a nearby elevator, leaving Daniels and Barnes behind. He finds an underground network of tunnels and carries Jacket out of the power plant. He meets with other soldiers and begins calling a medevac in the Ghost Wolves' signature code. When the operator doesn't understand, he throws caution to the wind and gives his coordinates. He turns to Jacket and comforts him, saying the chopper will be here soon. Jacket extends his hand to show his gratitude, and Beard tells him there's no need to thank him, saying it's on the house. Then says Jacket would have done the same for him. As the chopper approaches, Beard gives Jacket a memento so that he can always remember who saved him. It's the picture that the reporter took of them six months ago. Jacket looks at the picture and clutches it in his hand. He survives his injuries, and shortly after, Jacket and Beard are discharged from the military. In the years that follow, the two keep up with each other, calling each other regularly. They develop a close friendship, and Jacket even confides in a recent breakup with Beard. It seems the two have a friendship that will last for the rest of their lives. However, in April of 1989, Jacket begins having strange dreams about a man in a rooster mask, and also begins receiving strange messages on his answering machine that ask him to do seemingly innocent things at certain addresses. But when he arrives at the addresses, he finds members of the Russian Mafia who attack him for encroaching into their territory. After fighting for his life, he always goes to see his friend Beard, who got that gig at the convenience store he talked about way back in the war. Beard always greets his friend with a smile and frequently gives him free stuff. But strangely, Jacket doesn't just see Beard at the convenience store. He also sees him at a pizza shop, a video rental store, and a local bar. Even stranger, Beard acts differently depending on where he's working, sometimes acting as the Beard we know, but other times worrying about his job or glorifying violence. At one point, Beard notices Jacket doesn't look too good, and mentions he doesn't feel good either, saying it's a feeling he hasn't had since San Francisco. Soon after this, when Jacket goes to visit his friend, he notices Beard has since been replaced by a bald man that greets Jacket with hostility. Confused by the disappearance of his friend, Jacket never stays around for long, and one day when returning home, he is attacked by a masked assailant. He awakes shortly after to find himself in a dreamlike state, and is confronted by the man in the rooster mask he's been seeing in his dreams. The man directs Jacket to a warm bed in the other room, and Jacket finds it's himself lying in a hospital bed. Jacket then realizes that the attack by the rat-masked man put him in a coma, and he remembers the sad truth about his friend. He hasn't been seeing Beard work in all these places in Miami, 
because Beard has been dead for a number of years. Jacket remembers that shortly after being discharged from the military, Beard moved back home to San Francisco. He did get that job at a convenience store, just like he wanted, and he and Jacket kept up their friendship through frequent phone calls. However, on April 3, 1986, a nuclear bomb was dropped on the city by the Soviet Union. Beard was among those that perished in the explosion. Moments before his death, Jacket and Beard were talking on the phone, and Beard asked Jacket if he got around to sending him a copy of the photo they took in Hawaii. Jacket never did. The guilt of letting his friend down and the pain of losing him to the Russian attack filled the Jacket with anger. When the phone messages came pouring in years later and he found that they targeted Russians, Jacket went along with the missions to get revenge for his fallen friend. However, Beard was a peaceful man, so mass murdering Russians was not the best way to honor his memory. Instead, Beard likely would have wanted Jacket to continue with his life, finding the things that make him happy to help him cope with the pain he's had in his life and help him live in peace. But that's it for Beard, one of my favorite characters in the series. Since his levels only take place when he's a soldier following orders, you really get the notion that he's reluctant to take part in all the killing he does. And when you think about it, it's pretty ironic that the death of the peace-loving Beard was the catalyst for the mass murder of dozens of Russians. Like he says, things never turn out the way you expect them to. But that'll do until next time. If you have any questions, feel free to ask and I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you for watching and see you later. While we're more familiar with the more infamous mass maniacs that survived the events of 1989, there were several others that weren't so lucky. Among those that perished at the hands of the Russian Mafia was a large portly man named Jake. 